This video is the second part of a final prep session that I did for my Year 12 students ready for the AQA AS Chemistry Paper 1. Unfortunately, the video was too long to export, so I've had to cut it in two. So make sure that you've watched part one for all of the physical chemistry, and this is part two for all of the inorganic chemistry. It's in quite a bit less detail than my GCSE final prep sessions were because AS Chemistry just contains a lot more content, but I have covered all of the points listed in specification. In the first topic of inorganic chemistry, we learn that elements can be classified as belonging to the S block, the P block, the D block, or the F block, based on where they're found in the periodic table. And this in turn is determined by their proton number and which subshell their highest energy electrons are found in. Next, we look at some general trends across the periodic table using period three as our model for it. So the first trend is that as we go left to right across the period, the atomic radius decreases. And the reason for this is that we're increasing the number of protons and therefore the nuclear charge. And this means that the strong electrostatic force of attraction between the nucleus and the outer shell electrons gets stronger. There aren't any more shells. Everything in period three has three shells. So we're not having any increase in shielding. So it's just the nuclear charge that is affecting the radius. Even though we've already discussed first ionization energy, I'm going to take the opportunity to remind you again that these state symbols are crucial and you won't get the mark without them. You need to be able to describe that as we go left to right across the table, the first ionization energy in general gets higher because of the increased number of protons, with a couple of key exceptions. Firstly, when we get to aluminium, our highest energy electron is in the 3p subshell, which is higher energy than 3s, so we see a small dip. And then we see another dip when we get to sulfur, because here we have electrons being paired, and they are going to repel each other more than the other electrons already were, and so therefore it's going to be easier to remove that first electron. In order to describe differences in melting point across period three, we need to think about what kind of crystal structure we have. So sodium, magnesium and aluminium are all examples of metallic structures where silicon is giant covalent and then phosphorus, sulfur and chlorine are simple molecules and argon, of course, is monatomic. The second question to ask yourself is what is the force that's being overcome in order for this substance to melt? So for the metallic substances, it's a strong electrostatic force of attraction between the positive ions and the delocalized electrons. For the giant covalent structure, it's covalent bonds. And for the simple molecular substances and also the monatomic noble gas, it's going to be van der Waals forces. You could be asked to compare two substances from two different categories, say a metallic one and a simple molecular one, but you could also be asked to make comparisons within a category. So for instance, we can say that magnesium has got a higher melting point than sodium because it's got higher charged ions and also it's got more free electrons to make that bond. Likewise, if we look at our simple molecular substances, we know that phosphorus makes a P4 molecule, sulfur makes an S8 molecule and chlorine makes a Cl2 molecule. And this is reflected in their melting points as well, because those molecules have more or fewer electrons and therefore stronger or weaker van der Waals forces. The alkaline earth metals are found in group two of the periodic table, which is part of the S block. They have two electrons in their outer shells and therefore they make two plus ions, which is important for you to remember when you're creating symbol equations involving them. Because they're metals, they conduct electricity and they conduct heat. As you go down group two from beryllium to barium, the atomic radius gets larger. This is because the impact of adding another electron shell is much greater than the impact of the additional nuclear charge from the extra protons. Linked with this is the trend in first ionization energy. As you go down the group, the energy required to remove the first electron decreases because the ions are getting bigger. And this means that there's a weaker force of attraction between that outer shell electron and the nucleus. The melting point also decreases as you go down the group from about 1300 for beryllium down to about 700 for barium. Again, this links back to atomic radius. The atoms or cations are getting bigger, but there isn't any change in overall charge. They're all two plus charge ions. And so that means that that charge is kind of more spread out. And so this means that overall the charge density decreases and therefore the strength of the attraction from the ion to the electrons also decreases. As with all metals, the group two metals get more reactive as you go down the group because the outer shell electrons are more easily lost because they're further from the nucleus and they experience more shielding due to the greater number of shells. You need to be able to write equations for the reactions of group two with water. And in the case of magnesium, there are different equations for steam and for liquid water. So for steam, we're going to have our solid magnesium with our gaseous water because it's steam reacting to make magnesium oxide and hydrogen. And you're going to observe a bright white light just as you do if you make magnesium oxide by putting magnesium in a Bunsen burner. Then when magnesium, calcium, strontium and barium react with liquid water, it's acting as an oxidizing agent. 
So the magnesium is going to react with liquid water to make magnesium hydroxide and also hydrogen gas. That magnesium hydroxide would be a solid because magnesium hydroxide is sparingly soluble, so it's not really going to go into the solution. We know it's a tiny bit soluble because the pH is going to change by a tiny amount, but not by nearly as much as we would see if we had, say, calcium hydroxide, which is soluble and therefore would have the state symbol AQ. Calcium hydroxide is a colourless solution, but you are also going to be able to see some bubbles or effervescence from the hydrogen gas. The group 2 hydroxides get more soluble as you go down the group, and we can identify this by looking at the impact on pH. As we've just mentioned, magnesium hydroxide is only sparingly soluble. So a solution of magnesium hydroxide might only have a pH of 8 or 9, compared to a solution of barium hydroxide, which could be as high as 13 or 14. In terms of their uses, magnesium hydroxide is put in indigestion tablets in order to neutralise excess stomach acid, and calcium hydroxide is used by farmers to neutralise acidic soils in the fields where they're growing crops. Now, in contrast to the hydroxides, sulphates get more soluble as you go up the group. So the one to remember is barium sulphate, which is used in barium meals. In other words, it's used as a radiographic contrast agent. So if you're trying to take an X-ray of someone's intestines, they eat the barium meal and the barium sulphate will reflect their X-rays in the same way that bone would. It's safe to do this, even though barium sulphate is incredibly toxic because it won't dissolve in the body's fluids and therefore it can't be taken in. Barium chloride is also used as a test for um, sulphate ions. So the barium ions from the barium chloride will combine together with any sulphate ions that are in a solution to make a white barium sulphate precipitate. When we do this test, we acidify it first, usually using hydrochloric acid, because that way we're only adding chloride ions, which are in the barium chloride anyway. And the reason we do that is to remove any carbonate ions, which would give a false positive in that they would also generate a white precipitate. Titanium is a really important metal because it's so lightweight and so it's used for things like making jet planes. In order to extract it, we take an ore called rutile and heat this with chlorine and coke to turn titanium oxide into titanium chloride. And then the titanium chloride can be further reduced using magnesium or, in fact, sodium as a reducing agent. In other words, an electron donor. So you should be able to write symbol equations for that process as well. Sulfur dioxide, which is responsible for sulfurous acid, which causes acid rain, can be removed from waste gases from a power station by an acid base reaction with calcium oxide. Basically, we spray a slurry into the gases that contains these calcium based compounds and this removes the sulfur. Finally, we have the halogens, which are found in group seven in the P block and all have seven valence electrons. Just like group two, as we go down the group, we're going to see that there is an increased atomic radius because we're adding a new shell each time. Electronegativity is the tendency or power of an atom to attract a pair of electrons in a covalent bond towards itself. And fluorine is the most electronegative element in the whole periodic table, with electronegativity then decreasing as we go down the group. This also means that as we go down the group, things become steadily less good oxidising agents. So fluorine is a very good one. Astatine is a much poorer one. The reason for all this is this larger atomic radius, including more shells. So this means that the outer shell electrons are experiencing more shielding, and therefore there's a decreased attraction between the nucleus and the bonding electrons. And this is really important. You need to be talking about the bonding electrons, not just outer shell electrons in general, because electronegativity is about attracting electrons that are in a covalent bond. This also means that the bond polarity decreases as you go down the group. So we know that when fluorine bonds, it makes very polar bonds often. And also this is going to mean that the bond strength also changes. In terms of the boiling points, we know that fluorine and chlorine are gases where bromine is a liquid and iodine is a solid. And so all of these small covalent molecules are experiencing van der Waals forces. But because bromine and iodine are larger atoms and they make larger molecules that have more electrons, the van der Waals forces are stronger. This means that they take more energy to overcome and therefore iodine is going to have a higher boiling point than bromine and bromine higher than chlorine and so on. The more reactive higher up halogens are able to displace the less reactive lower down halogens from their compounds. So for instance, chlorine in the form of chlorine water can displace bromine from potassium bromide. Chlorine water is a very, very pale green, almost colourless. And in this reaction, we would see an orange solution forming as the bromine water formed. If we repeated this process with potassium iodide instead, we'd see a darker brown solution forming. You also need to be able to write um, ionic equations for this, in which case we would remove the spectator ions and just not include the potassium. And you also need to be able to write half equations too.
Sulfuric acid can play two different roles when it reacts with solid sodium halide. If it's acting as a proton donor, it's essentially being an acid, and we have a reaction that works a bit like this. Oh, why? When sulfuric acid reacts with solid sodium halides, it can perform two different roles. Firstly, it acts as a proton donor or an acid. So if we have some sodium chloride reacting with sulfuric acid, we make steamy white fumes of hydrogen chloride and also some sodium hydrogen sulfate. And this process will happen for any of the halides. And they're all just functioning as bases. But then if we think about bromide ions and iodide ions, which are the best reducing agents, then the reaction is able to go a little bit further with the acid acting as an oxidizing agent. This won't work for fluoride ions or chloride ions because they're not powerful enough reducing agents. So if we take hydrogen bromide that was formed in the first reaction, this can be split up into hydrogen ions and bromide ions. And these can react further with the sulfuric acid to make um, some bromine and some sulfur dioxide and some water. And you can see here that the sulfur is moving from a plus six oxidation state to a plus four oxidation state. So it's being reduced and acting as an oxidizing agent. Now, in this process, we make this sulfur dioxide, which we can't see, but because the bromine is produced at the same time, this makes the fumes turn brown. And then if we think about the iodide ions, um, we have a slightly different process. So we have these eight electrons here. They're coming from the iodide ions, um, eight of them being um, oxidized to produce four iodine molecules and also these eight electrons. And this can happen because iodide ions are an even stronger reducing agent than the bromide ions. You can test for the presence of halide ions in solution by using acidified silver nitrate solution. We acidify using nitric acid to begin with because this will remove any carbonate ions from solution and these would lead to a false positive because they would also give you a white precipitate. When you add the silver nitrate, silver fluoride would be produced if you had fluoride ions, but this is soluble, so there isn't an observable change. Whereas silver chloride will produce a white precipitate, and you should be able to write an ionic equation for this, showing how the two soluble ions form together to make this insoluble precipitate. So silver chloride is a white precipitate, silver bromide is cream, and silver iodide is yellow. And if we wanted to um, analyse those further, say, look at how much was made, we could filter them out of the solution because they are insoluble. Now, if you produce just silver chloride or silver bromide in isolation and you don't have anything to compare them to, it might be hard to say whether it is white or cream. So we can identify this further by adding dilute ammonia because silver chloride will redissolve in that dilute ammonia, but silver bromide will not. Small, carefully controlled amounts of chlorine are added to both drinking water and swimming pools in order to kill harmful microorganisms, despite the fact that chlorine is toxic. This is because on balance, the health benefits about not having pathogens in that water outweigh the risks of adding a small amount of a toxic substance. Chlorine can react with water in two different ways, depending on whether sunlight is available or not. When there's no sunlight, we see the chlorine reacting with water to make two different acids, hydrochloric acid and chloric acid. This is described as a disproportionation reaction because the chlorine is both reduced and oxidized going from an oxidation state of zero in chlorine to minus one in hydrochloric acid and plus one in chloric acid. And we can describe these processes using half equations. In the presence of sunlight, we see a different reaction being undergone. And as well as hydrochloric acid, we also have the production of oxygen gas. When chlorine reacts with cold dilute aqueous sodium hydroxide, it produces two major products, sodium chloride and sodium chlorate. Going from the oxidation state of zero in the elemental chlorine, in the sodium chloride, the oxidation state of chlorine is minus one and in chlorate, it's plus one. So this is another example of a disproportionation reaction. This is sometimes referred to as sodium chlorate one to differentiate it from sodium chlorate five, which we'll get to in just a second. So we have two major products here, and the sodium chlorate can be used for a variety of things, including making herbicides, explosives, dyes, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals and paper. Then if the sodium hydroxide is hot, we have a different reaction going on, but this one is still a disproportionation reaction. 
So this time we have sodium chlorate 5, where the chlorine has an oxidation state of plus 5 instead. And then the very last thing in paper one of AQA AS chemistry is the fourth required practical, which is a series of test tube reactions to identify cations and anions. Now we've gone through most of this already, but just to recap, we can identify which group two iron is present by looking at the solubility of their hydroxides and their sulfates. So if we add sulfuric acid, we're going to make a group two sulfate. And whereas barium sulfate is highly insoluble and forms a white precipitate, magnesium sulfate is very soluble. And so we would just see a colorless solution. If we think we might have ammonium ions, then we add sodium hydroxide and warm in a water bath so that ammonia gas would be given off. And then we test those fumes to see if they are ammonia gas with damp red litmus paper, which will turn blue in the presence of ammonia. As we've said, to identify group seven, we use acidified silver nitrate, which will form a white precipitate for chloride ions, a cream precipitate for bromide ions, and a yellow precipitate for iodide ions. And we can then also try to dissolve those precipitates using dilute ammonia, and the chloride, the silver chloride precipitate will dissolve, but bromide wouldn't dissolve. If we think we might have hydroxide ions, of course, those are what are found in alkalis, so we can do some kind of pH test, usually red litmus paper, which would turn blue. To test for carbonates, we can add any dilute acid and we would see effervescence. And if we really wanted to be sure, we could test that effervescence with lime water, which would turn cloudy if it was carbon dioxide being given off. And finally, to test for sulfate ions, we use acidified barium chloride, which will form a white precipitate. Thanks for watching, and I hope you're now feeling a bit more prepared for AQA AS Chemistry Paper 1. If you haven't already, then don't forget to go back and watch part one of this video for all of the physical chemistry that will also be in this paper. And finally, good luck for your exam.